everyone. My name is Nancy Sinkoff. I'm the academic director of the Allen and Joan Bildner Center for the Study of Jewish Life and professor of Jewish Studies and History here at Rutgers University. And it is my pleasure to be able to welcome you and then to moderate this fantastic event, the book launch of Dr. Donovan Ramon's first monograph, Striking Features, Psychoanalysis and Racial Passing Narratives. This book launch is sponsored by two very important institution Rutgers, the Institute for the Study of Global Racial, Racial Justice and the Allen and Joan Bildner Center for the Study of Jewish Life. The Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice is a conduit for new knowledge and ideas, providing opportunities for Rutgers faculty whose inquiries address racism and social inequality to work collaboratively and to affect meaningful action and positive change. In bringing together scholars from multiple humanities disciplines across Rutgers, from law to language, from philosophy to art, from history to gender studies, the Institute serves as a university-wide intellectual corridor that escalates the likelihood that these explorations and findings will inform real-world decisions, providing solutions to problems that have been increasingly thrust into sharp focus in the US and around the globe. The Allen and Joan Bildner Center of the Study of Jewish Life in its 26th or 27th year, we sometimes can't count straight, is committed to academic excellence and fostering scholarly exchange and connects the university with the community through its public lectures, Jewish film festival, Jewish communal initiatives, cultural events, and teacher training. The center sponsors visiting scholars and offers a wide range of programs for students and seminars for faculty. The activities of the Herbert and Leonard Littman Families Holocaust Resource Center advance the Bildner Center's commitment to reduce prejudice and promote intergroup understanding. Dr. Donovan Ramon was the fall Bildner Visiting Scholar, which explains our interactions and our uh, co-organizing a symposium next week, which I'll tell you more about in the closing of this program. But I want to emphasize is both the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice and the Allen and Joan Bildner Center for the Study of Jewish Life serve to fulfill the university's mission to create a beloved, inclusive community of scholars, students, staff, and to share that mission with a wide community. Our speaker tonight is Donovan, Dr. Donovan L. Ramon, an assistant professor of English at Southern Illinois University in Edwardsville. He is a specialist in African-American literature and African diasporic literature. He teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in all of these fields. He earned his BA in English and at the Special Honors Curriculum from Hunter College CUNY, where he, where he was a Mellon Mays Fellow, and he earned his PhD in African-American literature from Rutgers University. He's published articles on Philip Roth and Alice Dunbar Nelson, and most recently guest edited a special double issue of the South Atlantic Review on the 90th anniversary of Nella Larson's novel, Passing. Tonight, he will be speaking about his book, Striking Features, Psychoanalysis and Racial Passing Narratives, which was just published by Mercer University Press in 2024. The book explores the psychoanalytic motivations for jumping the color line in African-American literature. In conversation with Dr. Ramon is Dr. Michelle Stevens, the founding executive director of the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice and a professor of English and Latino and Hispanic Caribbean studies at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She is also a psychoanalyst and served as Dean of the Humanities in the Rutgers School of Arts and Sciences. She's the author of Black Empire, the Masculine Global Imaginary of Caribbean Intellectuals in the U.S., 1914 to 1962, and Skin Acts, Race, Psychoanalysis, and the Black Male Performer. That came out in 2014. She's published numerous articles on the intersection of race and psychoanalysis in such journals as Contemporary Psychoanalysis, Studies in Gender and Sexuality, and Psychoanalysis of Culture and Society. She's also co-edited three recent collections and Archaeopelagic Studies, Archaeopelagic American Studies with Brad Russell Davy, uh, excuse me, Brad Russell Roberts, Relational Undercurrents, Contemporary Art of the Caribbean Arch Archaeopelago, and Contemporary Archaeopelic Thinking with Yolanda Martinez San Miguel. So we have very talented people on this webinar. 
The format for tonight's book launch is indeed a webinar, and it means that you, the audience, will be muted throughout the presentation, but you can and should pose your questions into the chat feature, and I will co collect and collate and curate them and post questions to our two distinguished panelists at the end of their remarks. So enjoy the launch, and I will see you on the other end of this. Thank you, Nancy. Donovan, I think the floor is yours first. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Thank you for supporting my book, which I'm proud to say is now officially published, Striking Features, Psychoanalysis and Racial Passing Narratives, out with Mercy University Press. Um, so I, I want to thank you all for your support and Rutgers for hosting me again tonight. I earned my PhD at Rutgers, so I wrote my dissertation on racial passing, and I feel like this is a moment of coming home. I am coming home virtually, of course, because I'm in my office in Illinois, and you all are spread out, the guests and panelists, but this is certainly a moment of coming home for me in terms of me thinking a full circle moment. I began my research on racial passing over a decade ago, but that research yielded my dissertation, which yielded my first book. So I, I'm gonna start by, by just saying thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're very welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Donovan, did you want to maybe tell everyone a little bit about the book first, mm -hmm. just to get us all started? Yeah. Yes, yes. A so bit about its motivation. Yes, yes. I'm glad you asked me because because I wrote some notes, but I'm just going to sort of talk off the cuff. So even though the book was published this year in February 2024, Honestly, the book has been in the making for about 25 years. Um, and I say that because the ideas about passing have been sort of just marinating for, for quite some time now. So, okay, let me take a step back. In my book, I analyze racial passing narratives. I look at psychoanalysis and racial passing to really uncover the internal motivations for why people decide to jump the color line in African-American, well, in American literature over the past 20, uh, over the past, say, 100 years or so. I'm interested in looking at two areas that have not been put together before, racial passing and psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. Now, the two themes, the two areas have been discussed at length, separately, but not together. Mm -hmm. And I want to challenge myself to understand what are some of the psychoanalytic motivations? What are some internal motivations and external forces that make people want to jump the color line? So that's the uh, brief synopsis of my book. But I say this started about 25 years ago when I was a teenager. My very first summer job, I was at Riverbank State Park in Harlem, New York. My very first summer job in the summer youth program. And a young lady asked me, she, she heard that my last name, she heard my last name, but I'm on. She heard that my mother is from Honduras. And she said, oh, if your mother's Honduran and given her complexion, are you Garifuna? Or are your family Garifuna? Now the Garifuna are, are ship, or folks, they, they're still around, but the origin of the Garifuna, they were shipwrecked Nigerians in the Caribbean. Oral history would tell us that um, they were shipwrecked Nigerians who were trying to escape, of course, and they they were shipwrecked in the Caribbean. After their sh after being shipwrecked, they were they dispersed throughout Central America, the Caribbean, but certainly Central America. And she wanted to know when I was in this program if my mother was Garifuna, and I said, I don't know, I've never even heard that term before. I don't know. So I went home and asked my mom, and she says, no, we are not Garifuna. It's insulting for you to even ask me this question. Mm -hmm. And it just stayed with me. And I'm like, well, I don't understand the insult there. But I, I it, it made me pause and made me wonder then if there's something going on about my, my mother's line, my mother's side of the family. My father's Jamaican, but my mother's side of the family, what's going on there that make her, that'll make her have such a strong reaction? Mm -hmm. And over the years, I, did, I found out more, and I did some more research. The Garifuna are Nigerians. They have African roots. My mother is from Honduras. My mother's side of the family is from Honduras, Central America. My last name is Ramon, of course. And, and you know, looking at my family, they look like they are, uh, you know, Hondurans from Central America. But I suspect that they have Nigerian ancestry and they just haven't mentioned it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not going to blame my mom because um, she's still around and she might want her to get mad at me. But I just think, I think that she's heard over the course of her long life that maybe we should not affiliate with the Griefina because of their African roots, because of their, you know, the 
connotations about, you know, Africanness in Central America. Mm -hmm. uh, and that just stayed with me. And if that's the case, if, and this is big if I'm speculating here, if my family has negated their grief and the roots, they have engaged in the type of ethnic passing by avoiding the African roots and passing as Hondurans, as, as folks from Central America. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I had that in the back of my mind. And then so that's part one. Part two, as an undergrad at Hunter College, I took a bunch of courses in African American literature and I took a Black woman writers course. And in that course, I read Nella Larson's Passing, a book that fascinated me then and now. Mm -hmm. And then in another semester, I took an African American literature introductory course, and I saw some parallels between Nella Larson's passing and um, Jesse Fawcett's Plum Bun, which is a passing narrative from the Harlem Renaissance, and the autobiography of Next Color Man, another passing narrative that was published in 1912, but was republished in, during the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. There are some correlations there that stayed with me, and I'm like, what do I make of all these, these correlations between literature? I love to think comparatively, and I just, I kept thinking about it. Then fast forward to grad school when I'm at Rutgers, New Brunswick, and I'm tasked with coming up with a research idea. And I'm like, I'm going to write about passing, I guess. It's just been think I've been thinking about it. And then this brings me to you, Dr. Michelle Stevens. In <laughs> fall 2011, you taught a class called Race and Psychoanalysis. That was my last semester of coursework. And that was a critical moment when I said, I want to write about passing. I know I want to, I would like to write about Nella Larson's passing, The Ex-Colored Man, Plum, Bun's, Plum Bun by Jesse Fawcett. Uh, the Human Stain by Coleman Silk. I mean, by I'm sorry, by Philip Roth, and in some more obscure text. I want to write about passing, but I don't know what theoretical background to use. I took your class, and it taught me psychoanalysis, and the class is race and psychoanalysis. And I saw the two areas that have not been talked about before: race and psychoanalysis. And it got me thinking about racial passing. Yes. So I applied the theoretical perspectives from that class to all these ideas I had about passing and created my dissertation, which is now my book. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to, so that's a long answer. No, it's, but when it's... I was thinking about, you know, ethnic passing in my family, then reading these books, I saw some parallels between ethnic passing, which my family may or may not be doing, and passing as white in the United States. And taking your class really helped me. I don't know if you remember this, but um, in that class, we had to do uh, weekly responses. Mm. And in the, my, the first response, I wrote about Sigmund Freud and W.E.B. Du Bois. Mm -hmm. And you said, you liked it so much, you wanted me to read it to the class. Mm -hmm. And I was terrified. And I was like, oh, my, what? I can't, I can't, I, can't, I don't, I don't know, I don't know enough about this. That got me thinking, you know, that, that, that first class, that whole semester got me thinking about race and psychoanalysis, the tensions there, but also how they're correlated when it comes to racial passing. Yes. And along with an answer to your, your excellent question. No, no, but a, such a rich answer. So there's mm -hmm. so much there that I want to pick up on. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to move around in different directions. I have at least three different things. So we'll mm -hmm. look at them as we go along. The first one, mm -hmm. what your story of the of the, the, the Garifuna story that you just shared and that you share mm -hmm. in the book. So it raises, first of all, the question that passing is not simply for you about complexion, mm -hmm. right? And right. I wondered if you wanted to say a little bit more mm -hmm. about that. Like, that's what mm -hmm. struck me about your, the intentionality by you starting with that story. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's relevant in your personal history, right. but right. I feel like there's something that you're also saying, and it's partly what draws you to psychoanalysis, that mm -hmm. what is involved in passing mm -hmm. goes, you know, well beyond just a question of complexion, right? And mm -hmm. so with that as a kind of prompt, I wanted to hear what your thoughts are about that. I have so many thoughts. So I'm going to try to be clear and coherent when I when I answer another excellent question passing is not just about complexion and I think so yes my own example is is, is part of that but today passing so I, I'm going to define it passing just refers to you know the crossing of boundaries right any you know crossing of boundaries I'm thinking about racial passing so the crossing of a racial boundary right the boundary in America between black and white the crossing of that boundary but I would say that today, more than ever, if we're talking about, if we're discussing crossing of boundaries, boundaries today can be crossed in many, many, many ways. Mm -hmm. But even though my book is exclusively about racial passing, I talk about boundaries that have been crossed, say, with class, with sexuality, with mm -hmm. geography. Um, there's so many boundaries that we think are fixed and rigid that have been crossed that I think that I hope that my book tries to uncover. Mm -hmm. Take, for example, boundaries of geography. One of the things that I noticed throughout my research is that folks tend to pass in big urban cities. So Chicago for Inel Larson's passing or, or Harlem, where I'm from, Chicago and Harlem in, in that text, mm -hmm. Harlem and Jesse Fawcett's Plum Bun. 
um, or even Manhattan as a whole and real life passing narratives by an Anatole Boyard, who was a New York Times book critic, and, um, and Anita Reynolds, who was a dancer who passed. They both real life passers mm -hmm. went to New York City, just like some of the liter their literary counterparts, right? So it's also the crossing of geography that allows for boundaries to be crossed in terms of race. Yes. If we think of passing, or if we think of boundaries that are more fluid than we've considered before, then they are they have been crossed throughout the 20th and 21st century, and it's time for us to uncover them. It's yeah. not about race, class, geography, sexuality, et cetera, et cetera. So that insight is mm -hmm. what partly allows you to provide a very, I think, important and ingenious reading of Freud. Mm -hmm. So um, one, one of the things that's really powerful about the book is that you don't just kind of apply psychoanalysis, right? You mm -hmm. really, I think, I'm not going to say it anywhere as eloquently as you do, but you're thinking race through psychoanalysis and right. thinking psychoanalysis through race, yes. right? Yes. And mm -hmm. what better way to do that but to begin with mm -hmm. the founder, right? And mm -hmm. think about how does race impact mm -hmm. his role in psychoanalysis. There's even a phrase that you use, I made sure to write it down, again, a paraphrase, that mm -hmm. psychoanalysis is as much about using race versus yes. being racist right mm -hmm. and so I wanted to hear a little bit if you could expand a little bit more even on that distinction mm -hmm. how to think that the way you're thinking with psychoanalysis is mm -hmm. as much about how psychoanalysis uses race mm -hmm. as it is necessarily about psychoanalysis being racist which is something that black critics over time yes you know, critiqued. Yes. And while telling us a little bit about that, maybe just mm -hmm. say a little bit, you mentioned, when I said your answer was so rich, you mentioned this Freud Du Bois paper. I remember mm -hmm. you doing that presentation. <laughs> and that is such a rich section in the book. Mm -hmm. So yes, a little bit wherever you'd like to go about Freud and kind mm -hmm. of psychoanalysis using race to say mm -hmm. a little bit about that. Right. Well, first, I want to invoke Black critics. Black critics have, have historically said there is nothing, and I'm paraphrasing, um, Ten Spillers here, there's nothing about psychoanalysis that you could apply to race, okay? Mm -hmm. And she and other Black feminist critics in particular said that psychoanalysis is here, race is here. There's, there are no correlations between the two. And rightfully, I mean, I understand what, they, what they're saying. Psychoanalysis was founded by Sigmund Freud. They pointed to its very masculinist roots. It's very, what they saw as Europeanist racist roots that avoided um, Black subjects. And I understand that. I cite them, I understand that, and I, I, I say, I think they were on something here. But we also, in what I do in the introduction, I think we need to look at early psychoanalysis, Freud himself and how he created psychoanalysis. If you look at Freud's early writings on psychoanalysis, he invokes a lot of racialized language, metaphors or analogies or imagery where race was on his mind. And when I did some more digging into Freud's life himself, Freud's own life, he, his mother called him a, a blackamoor. She, co she commented on his complexion often, okay? Um, Freud tried to hide his Jewishness, okay? And um, slight sidebar, one of the reasons it took so long for this book to be published is because I make some claims about Freud that some Freudians didn't want to hear, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I say explicitly that Freud was passive, but I certainly think that he has some tensions when it comes to his, his identity, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to race, when it comes to class especially. So he was he was a psychoanalyst, of course, we all know that. And he tried to avoid the fact that he was, you know, Jewish in, in the late 19th century in Europe, when to be seen as Jewish meant to be had to have um African ancestry. Mm -hmm. To be seen as Jewish was racialized. And you mm -hmm. think about the logic of one drop, that meant if you were Jewish, you had one drop or more of African ancestry. Mm -hmm. And his mother would tease him, Freud's mother would tease him about his his um complexion. And I think that influenced him. You know, he was teased a lot in his youth because of his, because of his complexion. And I believe that influenced him to to create psychoanalysis. Mm -hmm. A lot of his early writings, he's going to talk about race. Um, he's going to talk about race, and he invokes metaphors of mixed race quite often. Which, to me, as literary scholar, I'm going to read between the lines any day. But mm -hmm. reading between the lines of Freud's own theories, he certainly has some tensions with how he portrayed himself. Um, I, I loved, by the way, the fact that you ground your mm -hmm. interpretive moves. There is in mm -hmm. in Horton Spiller's engagement with psychoanalysis, one mm -hmm. of the things that she says in those essays that you're mentioning is that there needs to be a kind of psychoanalytics. And she mm -hmm. uses that to talk about a kind of analysis of culture utilizing right. psychoanalytic me methods, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking of that because the way that you interpret um, 
in a sense, you use psychoanalysis as tools. Mm -hmm. In fact, for example, that boundary crossing and being in multiple self states, having mm -hmm. multiple states of consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's the bread and butter of psychoanalysis. The fact that then you then read kind of with or through a kind of racially inflected lens, psychoanalysis and Freud, mm -hmm. with that same kind of set of assumptions in mind, right? But mm -hmm. just slight addition of what happens if we bring his Jewishness back into the picture as a part That's of right. interpreting what he's doing, right? Yes, yes. It begins from your very, the, where you begin, where you cite that quote that says, you know, bold interpretations are yes. what mm -hmm. else, the psychoanalyst is, that's their bread and butter. You're like, and you're like, I'm gonna, and the literary critic too, it. I'm gonna go there, yeah. Let's do it. I wanna go there. And I know that some Freudian psychoanalysts were annoyed, and that's why it took a while to get this book published, but I think we need to go there. I'm not, you know, it's not about bad mouthing Freud. It's about contextualizing him. Mm -hmm. I want to contextualize him mm -hmm. and say that, yes, if he was interested in race and racial passing and his own creation of psychoanalysis, why not apply psychoanalysis to race and racial passing? He thought about it. Um, mm -hmm. I'll give you some even more, an an, a, a more explicit example. You know, I mentioned the boys and Freud. They were both contemporaries. They were the, the two leading intellectuals of the early 20th century, Sigmund Freud in Europe and W.E.B. Du Bois here. And they are both, you know, they both had instances of racialization in their youth. They both understood their blackness um, in, in when they were in the classroom in their youth. For, you know, for Du Bois, it's a more um, canonical example. We know about him not receiving that card when he was in that schoolroom in Massachusetts. And something similar happens to, the, to that, sorry, that was Du Bois. Void where somebody calls him out because of his complexion and is in the classroom. And I would say that both of those scenes that the, where the boys does not get that, the boys does get that card from the young lady because of his complexion, Floyd being called out because of his complexion, even though they're thousands of miles apart, there's something to be said about youth mm -hmm. and childhood and racialization. And I think that's why, if I'm honest, that's why a lot of Floyd's theories are grounded in youth. And mm. trying to look at youth and see, okay, what happens in youth that would dictate adulthood? Mm -hmm. And I believe that's a powerful move because both the boys and Floyd received, or not received, but um, were were traumatized in the mm. youth of the racialization. Oh, I'm they so were traumatized there. Yes. Mm -hmm. so and as a result you're... of that trauma, they created their respective theories, which I think we could use their theories to understand some of the trauma that racialized beings must go through today. Yes. So. I want to make sure that the, mm -hmm. to pull out then a powerful move that you make in relationship mm -hmm. to this very point. So there's a psychoanalyst who's one of uh, a leading figure in the school that I trained in of the interpersonalists, who um, his name is Harry Stack Sullivan, who talked about kind of chumhood and boyhood mm -hmm. and kind of youth, but not the youth in the developmental framework of the family unit, mother, father, mm -hmm. child, but the youth in kind of frameworks that have to do with their peers, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is, I always, I remember this back from the dissertation, I always thought it was such an original move on your part to focus on this other setting as a site of trauma in mm -hmm. youth that would be important for psychoanalysis and for racial passing, right? right. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the setting of the school. And mm -hmm. so I'd love for you to say a little bit more as you brought up youth, mm -hmm. what it is, and I'm gonna let you give us your term, but kind of like the insight uh, you had there <laughs> about that. Mm -hmm. My term is race learning. Yes. Okay, the term in this, my, the first chapter of my book, I'm not going to read it, I'm just going to talk, is race learning. And in my theory of race learning, my theory of race learning dictates that um, racialized beings learn about learn for, about race for the first time in the classroom. Mm -hmm. It's a classroom that is a trauma for those of us who are darker complected. And I use that term loosely because I don't think it's just an American phenomenon. I think if you are, if you are Black throughout the diaspora, and you enter a, a racialized space like the classroom, you're gonna understand what race means. Mm -hmm. So in that first chapter, I developed the theory of race learning. That's when black folks learn about race for the first time, in many cases, through the classroom. For example, um, The Autobiography of an Ex-Color Man by James Weldon Johnson. It was first published um, anonymously in 1912 because you know nobody really wanted to, he didn't, the, Johnson did not want folks to assume that the book was about him. I mean, it's called the autobiography anyway. He did not want the assumption to be, oh, it's my autobiography. And then it was published again in um, 1927, okay, uh, with his name during the Harlem Renaissance. 
Anyway, the main character, the ex-colored man, he is in the classroom and he's called, uh, two things happen. He's called the N-word, that's part two. Part one, the teachers say, hey, will all the white students stand up? He stands up and the white student, and the teacher says, no, you need to sit down because he's actually black. He didn't realize he was black. Mm -hmm. And that's a scene that has always stayed with me because oftentimes when folks, when folks have studied the ex-colored man, they said he started passing in adulthood after mm -hmm. he witnessed a lynching. Mm -hmm. Now look, lynching is a very powerful and very traumatic and horrendous thing. You know, there's no question about that. But I don't think that lynching that happens in adulthood is a start of him passing. I would say that he started passing in the classroom when the teacher said, no, you sit down. And when follow up after that, when his classmates called him the N word. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now that is a text from, you know, many from over a hundred years ago. That chapter also includes Caucasia by Dan Danzy Senna. Something similar happens where the main character, um, Birdie, she is also racialized in the classroom. And the context for the texts are about about a hundred years apart. There's something to be said in this hundred year time frame that black folks in the South for the ex color man and in Massachusetts for Birdie and Caucasia both learn about race in the classroom. Yes. So I would say that the trauma of the classroom mm -hmm. is what leads to race learning and why if you are, my argument, if you learn about race in the classroom in that trauma and you're light skin and you're light skin African American, the liter literature tells us that that would be the first step to passing. Mm -hmm. Not waiting for a lynching, which is horrific, or any other racialized problems in adulthood, it starts in youth instead. Mm -hmm. And again, that's why I'm drawn to psychoanalysis because so much of psychoanalysis um, rests on, let's look at youth and see how youth can predict adulthood. Yes, yeah. So there is another, we've been talking a lot on the psychoanalysis side. Mm -hmm. I'd like to talk a little bit, move you a little bit to the more black study side. Mm -hmm and ask you to share. So I found fascinating mm -hmm. you are revising how we think about the tragic mulatto narrative, right? Mm -hmm. Anyone who is in black literary studies knows that, the, and, and that and that's black diasporic literary study, that the tragic mulatto, the tragic mulatta mm -hmm. um, are kind of tropes of racial passing, old tropes. Mm -hmm. And for the audience, tragic, because often the character who is racially passing mm -hmm. must die at the end of the narrative. Right. And so mm -hmm. literary critics, you know, identify this seems to be a given. Right. Mm -hmm. But Don, when you do something very interesting by reading more contemporary narratives and issues around death and the question mm -hmm. of death and, you know, returning and, and utilizing and thinking with psychoanalytic mm -hmm. notions of the death drive. But I even feel like that chapter actually even moves beyond psychoanalysis because it it raises some broader questions about mm -hmm the self and the annihilation of the self and mm -hmm. what it is that the passing subject is going through. What are the various deaths that they are living A, mm -hmm. and then how do they manage their own death? And there you have another, you know, resonant phrase, an active death, right? Mm -hmm. So this question is kind of more from the black study side, like mm -hmm. what was important to you about, um, allowing and getting scholars in black studies to mm -hmm. kind of think take a second look at or rethink or think about this tragic mulatto tragic mulatto narrative in its relationship to passing narratives mm -hmm. it was important to me because i understand you know the history of psychoanalysis has been seen as you know white whitewash european i wanted to balance it out with scholarship from black studies and when it comes to death so much of african american history has been rooted in death whether it's, you know, jumping off the boats during the Middle Passage, uh, you know, act of suicide, you know, a lot of, you know, a lot of folks who were enslaved or were going to be enslaved in the Middle Passage would choose death over enslavement, right? Even in the United States, once they got to the shores here in North America, they would choose, you know, once they realized what their lot would be, they would choose death over, over their life in enslavement. So, so much of Black life has been rooted in death. Um, I'm thinking about Claudia Rankin's excellent article, uh, the condition of black life is one of mourning, because if they're not, if we're not thinking about death, we're also mourning those who have died. And so much of black history and black life is one of violence, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what I wanted to do when I talk about death here, I want to understand the layers of death for African Americans, but especially for those who are racially passing. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start very basically, you know, passing in the context of race refers to, you know, folks jumping the color line. 
Passing also could refer, there's a semantic connection there. Passing refers to death too. Right, because right. passing away is a very polite, euphemistic way of saying somebody died. Mm -hmm. And I think the semantic connections are very pivotal and very interesting for us to ponder. If you were passing away, what's the what's the distinction that I ask myself between passing away and passing as white? Mm -hmm. And I think they are very similar. If you were passing as white, there is a part of you that has to die. Okay, and that's something that I try to uncover throughout the text, uh, the close readings I do. A lot of the folks who jump in the color line, they um, they turn their backs on their families. To them, their families are dead. Okay, mm -hmm. they would pass not only as white, but pass as people who are unaffiliated by with their relatives. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, in the chapter on the death drive. So in that chapter, I apply Freud's death drive, or I don't know if apply is the right word. I situate Freud's death, death, death drive in a conversation of light-skinned African-Americans who pass to see the semantic connections, but to tease out the fact that there are multiple deaths. There are multiple deaths that occur with passing. There's a pat the death of the family members. Mm -hmm. Those who are passing will say, I'm no longer affiliated with that Black family. They're over there. I'm over here. That also goes alongside with movement. You know, to say my family is dead, they have to move out to small towns they were in, move to a bigger city, a big metropolis where there's more people, i.e. Chicago, New York City, Mm -hmm. New York comes up and most if not all passing narratives I study you know mm -hmm. moving to a bigger city means more people around more anonymity right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I define the term active death because I don't think it's a matter of the tragic mulatto just passively dying it's a matter of them taking taking the initiative and saying I cannot live my divided selves I'm actually going to die mm -hmm. so the example I point to that I find most provocative is Nella Larson's passing. Mm -hmm. Critics have said for the past almost 100 years that um, um, Irene, let's see, it's Irene Claire, that Irene pushed Claire out the window, mm -hmm. right? And other critics have said, no, you know, I think Claire jumped out the window or her racist husband, you know, pushed her out the window. I would say that she probably committed suicide. And it's not that she committed suicide because of her husband or because of Irene, because the weight of being a light-skinned African-American in a racialized, racialized society was too much for her. Mm -hmm. And when I contrast that with, say, The Stones of the Village, which is a short story by Alice Dunbar Nelson, the main character does something similar. He doesn't jump out the window, but he, he, um, he negates, he's choking to death. And the main character, Victor, um, He's choking to death and he he waves away when people bring him water. He does not want to be helped, but he's choking to death. And mm -hmm. typically if you're choking, you want someone to help you. Mm -hmm. He waves them away. Mm -hmm. Between Victor and Stones of the Village and and um I or Claire and passing, there's something there about them just saying, you know what, I'm dying, but or I'm gonna I'm gonna be forceful in in mm -hmm. in my death. And that's why I come up with the term active death. I, I think tragic mulatto is too easy to say that, oh, they just passed away. No pun intended. They forced themselves. They wanted to, 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 they wanted to die because that is a way of, you know, that's the reaction to crumbling under the weight of being in a racialized society. Well, that right there is what I was thinking is that mm -hmm. the tragic mulatto trope, it almost places the blame slash burden mm -hmm. on the character, right? And right. that was part of the 19th century discourse, right? Mm -hmm. That there was something problematic about this character and it's almost like to society's betterment in a mm -hmm. sense that the character has to die like the story has to mm -hmm. end that way because mm -hmm. this kind of character is a problem for society Absolutely. in your book mm -hmm. you mentioned that one of the links between Du Bois and Freud is that there is a way in which they are both interested at some level in a mm -hmm. problematic society not a right. problem for society, right? Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. more contemporary tales and the more contemporary deaths, mm -hmm. at some level, when you say that they die, you know, actively because mm -hmm. of having to do with the burden of living in this kind of racialized society as a person who is who can pass, mm -hmm. there's a commentary there on the society as opposed to all the burden being placed on the Absolutely. character. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it's totally commentary on society. And I think that's why death comes up so often in passing narratives. I yeah. think there's a correlation between the, the problems that we deal with as a society and death. And when it comes to passing, passing as white, again, passing this passing as white, that's one type of death because you're killing off your blackness. Another type of death, you're, you're hiding your family. You're saying often my family's dead. Um, and then, you know, and, you know, and another type of death, your physical death, when it comes to the active death, you're physically saying, okay, 
as a result of all that society has placed on me, I cannot live any longer. OK, and I actually want to shout out um, Dolores Johnson, who wrote the she wrote one of the blurbs for my book. She talked about her. She wrote a book called Say I'm Dead, a family memoir of race, secrets and love. I'm not sure if Dolores is on is on the call tonight, but she was a classmate and a friend of Cheryl Walls. And she got in contact with me because she was writing a book about her family, uh, her family's passing as white. And the title of the book, Say I'm Dead, that is a that is something that real life racial passers and fictional racial passers have said, you know, yeah. to say I'm dead. That black side of me is gone. I'm not living my white life in typically a major metropolitan area. That black side is gone, so say I'm dead. Yeah. That's not just a book title. That is what a lot of racial passers, real and fictional, have to say. Yes. Mm -hmm. I know that we're coming close to time when we want to hear mm -hmm. from those who have, you know, kindly um, joined us. But I have one more question that might be a little bit left field and it probably won't work if you haven't seen the film. But I was okay. curious. So I have to ask that first. Have you mm -hmm. seen American fiction yet? Would Absolutely. Ever... Absolutely. Okay. I okay. love it. Yeah. Okay. So I want to <laughs> hear what, because talk about passing, quote unquote, not being mm -hmm. quite about complexion. Like, here's <laughs> a kind of, and of course, since, you know, Philip mm -hmm. Roth's Human Stain is so much a focus of your last chapter. And mm -hmm. I, I know a work that you've thought a lot about. You know, yes. there's some kind of parallel in storyline between mm -hmm. that story and Coleman Silk's character. Obviously, there are some differences too. Right, so I, right. I, I, I knew that I wanted to ask you tonight mm -hmm. what you thought about that film, Jeffrey Wright's mm -hmm. character, the dilemma that is being posed in that film, mm -hmm. and whether we might want to think about it as a kind of passing narrative, mm -hmm. but like in a weird river, you know, passing for black, like, ah. right? And so I just, I just wanted, and you, you, you could speak to that or just yeah. what your thoughts were about the film itself. I love the film. I love it. And I saw it when it first came out. And now I wish I, I watched it more recently so I could talk with a little bit more, more, um, more nuance about it. I will say I loved it. And I think that what Jeffrey White played the, the, the heck out of that character, um, and I think it's a dilemma that a lot of creative Black folks have to deal with. No, that not no. take that from the record. It's a dilemma that a lot of Black folks have to deal with. It doesn't matter whether you're creative or what field you're in, because what struck me about the movie was uh, the scenes where he had to code switch. Where he was on the phone, the conference call, and they want him to talk like this, like he's from the hood, like that code switching, even though he's like a college-educated professor and creative writer, they want him to talk like this. They want him to, to create a narrative that he has no business writing. And to me, that that code switching is a type of passing. Yeah. And no judgment here. All of us who are African Americans, Black folks, people of color, and mostly white society, and mostly white society, and or mostly white professions, we feel the need to do this at various points anyway. So all that to say, I love the movie. It is incredibly well done. Um, Jeffrey Wright played an excellent role, and even his walking, the scene when he was the restaurant and he changed. Yes. The there walking, you go. There you which go. captures the idea of the. Mm -hmm. This is a fully embodied experience, and it, it makes you it think of your passing Absolutely. character yes. and historical yes. figures, right? That Absolutely. the way mm -hmm. they speak, the way they write, so much has to change. You know, mm -hmm. they they marry, they have children, they, they've created right. whole kind of new selves. You know, mm -hmm. and all they have to embody those new selves it right is. they have to embody it yes and they not only do they have to embody it they have to maintain it for given the different context that they're in and that's why code switching to me is so fascinating it is so so fascinating because you know that is sort of a linguistic passing code switching is a way of linguistic passing and that scene with a conference call it was hysterical and nuanced and and very telling because many of us have to deal with that yes mm -hmm. <laughs> I see Nancy has rejoined yep. us. <laughs> I have to, um, I, I'm gonna, I have to restrain myself. I have so much to say. So I'm gonna say two <laughs> little things and then take questions from the audience. Um, um, you know, I come to, I come to Donovan's incredibly rich work through my engagement with modern Jewish history and the ways in which Jews have had to adapt to Christian society, both in Europe and in the United States. And I just want to just mention that I'm sure it's very true in the experience of people of color that there's a spectrum of strategies of adaptation. And um in in and and there's because there's a spectrum, there's a spectrum of coding of difference. Mm -hmm. So I just read, I just talked with my students yesterday 
um, Hitler's prophecy in 1939, where he talks about the Jews being an Asiatic influence mm -hmm. and, and, and that, you know, Christian not, well, he doesn't have Christian, but we know it's part of the Christian West that the Reich is going to protect Europe from the Asians. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's not the way people in many people code Jews as being Asiatic, but in fact, from the, in the race discourse from the 1870s until 1924, Jews from Eastern Europe were seen as Asians and Asiatic, and it was right. part of the peril of the mm -hmm. yellow fever peril from the West. So mm -hmm. it's just, I think what's so com complicated about mm -hmm. the color line is that, and you've noticed this Donovan, is that it shifts. Mm -hmm. And then those who are seen as different, they have to, they have to readapt, mm -hmm. right? You know, I'm no longer Asian, I'm this now, and I'm this now, and I'm this now. And, and they're always, um, they're on sufferance, right? Because they never fully belong and they always have to morph. And, you know, we talked about this, um, Donovan, you know, we both have read and admire Margot Jefferson and right. mm -hmm. her work, Negro Land, going through the physical characteristics that light-skinned Blacks have had to do, the way, they, the way people walk, the noses, the hair. And I can tell you every chapter in that book could be applied to the Jewish experience. Mm -hmm. Nose jobs hair straightening, mm -hmm. uh, complexion issues, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so Freud, I think for Freud, his passing, his code switching, uh, I just, I'm obsessed with code switching. I just think it's so important. I think our students actually need to learn more about it. They need to speak to us differently. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but, um, they need to code switch in the classroom. But I think Freud wasn't only ashamed or traumatized by his complexion. He was traumatized by the history of being East European Jew going to Vienna, going right. from the periphery to the metropole mm -hmm. and what that meant and coming from a background that was seen as backward and benighted. And when we think of American Blacks coming from the South and great migration, coming from rural homesteads, mm -hmm. often communities that were supportive, even if they were absolutely traumatized by the failure of reconstruction and of slavery, but then moving to the metropole, what that meant in bringing that rural, often Southern experience the North is also traumatic. So Freud, Freud's family definitely experienced that because they oh, came yes. from Austrian Poland and Moravia and then they, he ended up in Vienna and then of course in London. So I just wanted to mention, make that comment. The last thing I'm, um, I'd love more to talk about American fiction. The other film to talk about of course is Imitation of Life mm -hmm. where there's of course a death. Right. The price of passing is a death. And then the trauma, the guilt on the part of the young woman who tries to pass, right. she's essentially killed her mother by passing. Mm -hmm. So I just want to, mm -hmm. and, and then it just leads me to the psychoanalytic issues of death, you know, the fear of death, which is of course right. mm -hmm. so central to Freud. Mm -hmm. Okay, I could say a lot more things, but I want to, um, <laughs> I want to give, I want to give our attendees. Um, so one, um, one attendee, wanted to know and they and they kind of apologized um in a way they said maybe it's asking too much of a preview of the book or you know just a launch like this but is your thesis professor ramon that passing is a defense strategy engineered as a response to racialized trauma hmm. i think that's part of it yes because i yes yes i want to I want to say that there's some external motivations and internal motivations. That's where the psycho and an analytic piece comes from. But uh, yes, I would say yes. It's a defense strategy. Um, engineer. I'm. I, I guess I'm pausing on the word engineered. I'm yeah. curious as to what the speaker means by that. Engineered as a response to racialized trauma, because I want to also make clear racialized trauma is a real thing that folks have had to deal with for mm -hmm. millennia, centuries in this country. Um, I guess I'm just questioning the term engineered, but overall, yes, is passing can be a defense strategy against the um, the racialized trauma. And I, I think I made that clearest probably in chapter one, where I'm talking about the classroom and race learning and how, you know, the trauma of the classroom is what what propels people to want to jump the color line way before something like a, lynch a lynching or other racialized violence would occur, like an ex-colored man. Mm -hmm. And I'll just want to add something to underscore uh, Donovan, mm -hmm. your point. People think of something like a lynching as a more obvious trauma, but then mm -hmm. someone like choosing to pass as white, you know, where there mm -hmm. isn't some obvious violent thing that seems to have happened, it can mm -hmm. feel like 
you know, it's some kind of like choice, right? And I, maybe I hear a little bit about choice in the word engineering or engineered. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that is an important tension in it, right? That they create selves out of passing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But what I love about your race learning chapter is you have right. a much more sophisticated um, representation of what trauma looks like, big T, right. small T, what violence looks like, big V, small V, right? Mm -hmm. That violences and traumas are happening in the classroom and interpersonal yes. interactions right mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. i think what's really important about that chapter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank can you I, I had the most to say about that chapter so i'm glad it's coherent thank you <laughs> can i just sort of um interject here because i think the word engineered was um uh, uh challenging and, and i also am looking at the chat and the q a but this relates i think to your use of the phrase act of death that professor mm -hmm. stevens also brought up and um you know sort of implicit in that is the agency of that choice you know, do you use, because I haven't read the whole book yet, but I'm thinking again, coming from where I come from, mm -hmm. um, the question of martyr, martyrdom, the choice to martyr mm -hmm. is that, and, and a martyr means a witness, right? So, right. you know, you can't be a martyr in your, you, you know, if you, if you actively take your own life in your, the, in your home mm -hmm. and no one knows it, that you don't qualify as a martyr. Martyr has to be right. public. So the statement is, is communal and social. Mm -hmm. um, so does that figure, and again, it's, it's religious terminology, so maybe Freud has shoot it, but, um, you know, the future of an illusion and all that, but is that the way you see an act of death is sort of an act of public, a statement, uh, a, a statement for the community to see the, the repercussions of the choice hmm. or whatever? <laughs> hmm. I, uh, for the community, I wouldn't say that, well, Yes, I think so. I think, you know, you know, I didn't think about it in those terms until you asked me that question. But um, we could read it as a statement to the community because the indictment would be when we're living in a racialized society. Hey, stop being racist and we wouldn't feel this way. Or another way to put it, we, there would not be racial passing. You know, if we, if we did not have a racialized society, there would not be the need to jump the color line in the first right. place. Right. So we could totally read it that way and certainly as an indictment of being in a racialized um, oppressive society. Yes. So yes. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have a couple more questions, and um, mm -hmm. we're we're gonna um, it, you know, this happens. You get one question, and then then people start saying, "Oh yeah, right." Yeah. So um, <clears throat> someone wanted from Kentucky. Uh, mm -hmm. So oh. there you go. You're my people. Mm -hmm. You're your people. Yeah. You're oh people. yes, I see the okay. chat now. Okay. <laughs> They'd like you to talk about someone like Rachel Dolezal, um, meaning this <laughs> opposite passing move, right? The move of a white person mm -hmm. to claim either black identity or sometimes Latin American identity or, <laughs> or yeah. um, you know, Coleman, mm -hmm. I mean, Coleman becomes a Jew. So mm -hmm. there it's, it's, so I think they would like you to um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> just say some more about that. Yeah. When it comes to people like Rachel Dolezal, I write about her briefly in my last chapter because she just gets me so annoyed. I don't want to spend too much space on her. Uh, like, you know, use too much of my narrative space on her. <laughs> but I put her in the context of those who, who in the past couple of years have been passing as people of color. Mm -hmm. And this relates to the talk I gave at Rutgers in October. Um, like, I think it's proximity to Blackness that has allowed her to pass. Not just her, but her and um, Jessica Krug and, you know, other folks you could, over the past couple of years, more and more people are coming out as passing as people of color, it is um, it is proximity to blackness that has allowed that to happen. And in the case of Dolezal, she went to Howard, she Howard University and HBCU. Um, I think she um, she taught, yeah, she taught black studies at her local community college. She was chair of her local chapter of NAACP. All of those are, you know, sort of middle-class markers of blackness. All the markers of blackness after her, after her, the media firestorm, she became a single mother. She was on welfare. I found out a couple of weeks ago that she 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 lost her job because she was doing porn somewhere on on OnlyFans or whatever. So there are all these markers of blackness that she has tried to appropriate. And I don't know if I will say it's it's passing per se. It's more proximity to blackness that she's really trying to approximate, and she's done a miserable job at it. And that is an indictment on her. That's also an indictment of academia because so many people in the past couple of years 
have been called out for passing to people of color, and they've been affiliated with academia in some way, shape, or form. Jessica Krug is a, is a is a an example I mention often. Um, I can't think of other. Um, there's somebody else I just had on tip of my tongue, but Jessica Krug, Rachel Dolezal, they are all modern folks who are pretending to be. They're pretending to be black. They are really taking advantage of this proximity to blackness and running with it. And I do, I do, I don't think highly of them at all. And they are problematic because they could just be white allies. I don't really like that phrase, but for lack of a better phrase, they could say, "Hey, I support Black Lives Matter without pretending to be black." Well, you and know, I mean, or taking resources away from black folks. I think there's a lot. There's a lot about a lot we could have a much longer conversation about. Mm -hmm. um, how we view as academics the possibilities of teaching mm -hmm. right. broadly mm -hmm. outside of our own personal subjective experience. Like, is that no longer allowed? And so why these women, we're talking about two women here, mm -hmm. felt the need to, discuss, to, to be cultural <clears throat> thieves in a way, mm -hmm. in the most horrible way and, and caricatured way, actually, too. Proximity to what kind of Blackness? The Blackness that they defined, which mm -hmm. is, right. you know, right. with, you know, the speaking, code switching, and um, because somehow they felt, and I don't really get into their psychology, that's for their psychotherapist on the couch, but <laughs> somehow they must have felt mm -hmm. that they could not represent or teach mm -hmm. or be allies, again, a word I don't love either. Mm -hmm. um, the, the just demands of people of color without somehow appropriating that. And I think that that's sort of a larger question for the academy, you know, yes. about the ways in which we think we should, all of us should be able to read everything and teach everything, you know, mm -hmm. literature mm -hmm. should be colorblind, but that's mm -hmm. a little bit of polemic on my part. Um, <laughs> because I, I, I kind of think the humanities is about cultural quote appropriation unquote. Mm -hmm. You have, What's literature if you can't read broadly? I mean, just would be, right. what, a, what a loss for all of us. Um, yes, but you said something really helpful, mm -hmm. Nancy, that I was thinking with. You said, you, what form of Blackness was a problem? Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. if we, you know, the, the idea that in the educational space, mm -hmm. both much younger and much older, mm -hmm. there is tropes of identities that right. people then adopt, right? Mm -hmm. that people Codes are tropes, they're metaphors, they're, you know, signifiers, right? And mm -hmm. so that I, I felt it was helpful. I felt like you put put a pin on it that it's not right. just the appropriation of blackness, it's that any attempt to appropriate is going mm -hmm. to construct an identity in a certain way. And there's all kinds of features that come with that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And you're making me realize that as academics, we can't explicitly ask about race. Right, so I'm take, thinking, for example, um, Jessica Krug or Rachel Dolezal because they used um, they used resources that were for Black students, right? With them using resources for Black students, you know, they were light skinned women. Nobody said to them, "Well, you actually don't look like you're <laughs> excuse me, you don't look like you're Black." Nobody's going to say that. I'm a Melon Mays fellow. I know there's some melons on the on the on the call, so shout out to Melon Mays. Um, I believe that that um, it was Jessica Krug who got some funds from the McNair Scholarship Program, which is similar to Mellon in terms of getting more folks of color in academia. And the, one of the reasons they were able to pass is we, because we kind of ask, hey, are you black, are you white? On the applications when you're submitting for fellowships for, for research funds, et cetera, et cetera. On top of that, we also know that affirmative action was dismantled in the past year. So this idea of passing cultural appropriation in academia, I hate to be pessimistic, but I think it'll happen more and more. Yeah. I think it'll happen more and more. And I hate to say that, but with, with yeah, I, I'm going to leave it at it. I, I think it's going to happen more and more. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So someone um, had a different question, more about the psycho sort of developmental stages of psychoanalysis and your terminology. So I'll put it up <clears> to you. Mm -hmm. Person said, um, queried, um, he's interested in your use of the term youth, Mm -hmm. Instead of childhood, getting into the weeds here, <laughs> when it comes to the time period of the traumatic encounter with race and the focus of psychoanalysis. Um, so why not, why youth and not childhood? Again, I don't, you know, that's for you. And then mm -hmm. the other issue, question, related question in this uh, participant is, he's curious about the place of the life drive in the question of passing. 
-hmm. especially mm -hmm. since the life drive tends to be defined by Freud. And again, both of you have to correct if, if this person is incorrect, um, as a drive towards communing or merging into a larger community body. And then mm -hmm. he thanks you for amazing work, but so <laughs> youth versus childhood, mm -hmm. and then the role of the life force or the life drive mm -hmm. um, in Freud's work and in, I guess, your char the this characters you studied. Mm. So I use youth, and I may have used youth verbally with, with in the talk tonight, but in my book, I use them interchangeably. Youth and childhood, to me, refer to, you know, um, I'm well, okay, I'm talking about a certain time when these characters are passing. Typically, it's when they're in K through 12. So when they're in K through 12, that's the time I'm referring to, because that's when the trauma really, really comes out, the racialized trauma comes out, before they get to college, when they're in K through 12. Uh, but I use the term as interchangeably, because... Frankly, Freud thought about youth in a sort of expansive sense because he wanted to see what elements of youth really play out in adulthood. And that's why I refer to those uh, those terms. Hopefully that answers the question. I may have used youth verbally here, but absolutely in the book, I use them interchangeably in part because of Freud's own use of the terms. And then the issue about, um, I guess, the life drive versus the death drive. Um, yeah, I didn't really do too much something about that while you're thinking mm -hmm. that I'm mm -hmm. gonna link it back to Paul mm -hmm. clarified his his use of engineered mm -hmm. in ways that would very much matches with what I was saying about choice and it, ah, yes. it allows me to say something again about that which is mm -hmm. their side of this which I do think Donovan's book is interested in also mm -hmm. that has to do with the the drive to survive the drive to live i mean yes. passing mm -hmm. subjects are joining communities right yes. it's mm -hmm. just that they're also mm -hmm. leaving they're leaving one set of communities and they're joining mm -hmm. another set of communities right and mm -hmm. there's all kinds of power and status and class and recognition and race issues but the drive to live right mm -hmm. is also a part of passing right mm -hmm. um and it, and in the way that i think paul meant it about engineering they are self-engineering right mm -hmm. and that is an important active part of an active living as much mm -hmm. as it also has the complexities and the conflicts that might lead to an active death mm -hmm. so that was that's a thing something that yes does bear emphasizing yes you said it better than I could have. I'm trying to, I was trying to think about it and I, I'm going to second that answer. Also, yeah. I think the people who, pa who actively pass often say they need to in order to survive. I mean, they do. I mean, again, I'm thinking, I'm looking at the psychoanalyst, um, analyst, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm, and I just screened Imitation of Life because mm -hmm. I hadn't seen it. And the young woman, um, uh, uh, Piola, mm -hmm. she says, I, I will die if I do not do mm -hmm. this. I mean, it's a reversal. Right. It's, it's I will die if I do not do this. And then of course the consequences are so grave. Mm -hmm. So clearly from the passer's perspective, mm -hmm. it is a life drive in their psychoanalytic sense. And I, again, going back to the experience of Jews, I mean, you know, baptism, going to the baptismal font to survive mm -hmm. was a very, was a strategy for Jews since uh, 15th century Iberia. Mm -hmm. um, and and then through 19th century German lands, of course, it, it all came to naught in the 20th century because of the racialized notion of Jewishness. But it used to be, quote unquote, that theologically religious conversion, that form of passing would let you survive as right. a Jew. Mm -hmm. when, when Jews are racialized, it no longer works. So I think it's a really fascinating question. There's a life drive. Right. But the consequences, you know. Mm -hmm. Are, are never, nothing's ever linear and there's always mm -hmm. a psychoanalytic dialectic. Mm -hmm. So you have another question. I knew this has happened, this always happens at the end. <laughs> um, uh, excellent work. So let's give a shout out there. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Ramon, you mentioned the role that geography uh, plays yes. in passing, mm -hmm. particularly the move into urban densely populated city centers that offer anonymity. Have you come across cases in your research where passing transpires at the peripheries maybe mm -hmm. in more rural areas, or is this phenomenon really dependent on in itinerant migratory ge geographies across cityscapes? Michael, shout out to Michael. He is a fellow Mellon Mays fellow. He's another Mellon Mays fellow like myself. There you go, uh, there you go. Shout out Michael at Vassar. Um, I will say this, that's an excellent question. All the examples in my book, they are, they're moving to the city. They're moving to the city. Uh, now I'm sure there are examples that exist, but I haven't found them yet. 
So to answer your, your question explicitly, um, it is more dependent on migratory geographies across cityscapes because oftentimes folks are in, they're in rural areas, then they move to the cities, then they move to, the, to big metropolitan areas. Chicago is one example. New York City is often the, the, most, um, the most frequent example in literature because New York City is awesome, but also because there's so many people that will move to New York City. If it's truly the melting pot, melting pot you can easily move to New York and, and, and obscure your past identity and blend in with all the identities that's there. That's so why people just, come to New York to reinvent themselves. Right, exactly. From rural, yeah. you know, that's been, you know, mm -hmm. think of, um, you know, uh, Edward uh, White's great essay. Right. Yes, people, exactly. you know, people want, they, the, New York is this odd metropolitan mm -hmm. frontier. It sure, but, yes, yes. And that's a great way to put it, metropolitan frontier, uh, AKA the melting pot. You yeah. can go to New York and you can, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Make it anywhere right? But if you, another way to put that in literature, if you can pass in New York, then why worry about the, the rural or the rural, the rural context that you left behind? Yeah. So it's mostly cities, mostly, you know, and mostly cities and most specifically New York City, a, a big metropolitan area. Yeah. I'm going to do a quick shout out to Hugo. He asked the question about childhood. <laughs> okay. Hugo doing excellent work on psychoanalysis mm -hmm. and the creation of the subject okay. and the importance of childhood in that. And <laughs> in literature. So I'm so glad that he was reading yes. you and you are meeting him virtually because I think cool. mm -hmm. very much speaks to each other. Mm -hmm. Thrilling, thrilling. Um, anyway, I find this all, you know, Donovan, I mean, ever since, so the backstory here for me is that I knew, <laughs> somehow heard about Donovan through the late Cheryl Wall. Mm -hmm. and. Um, <laughs> I am very, very interested, very interested in Roth, Philip Roth, and a late comer to his fiction. And The Human Stain still strikes me as such a brilliant, complicated book. And when I heard that Professor, well, then graduate student Donovan Ramon was working on Roth and Larson, I said, I got to meet this guy. And there you go. It's been incredibly enriching for me. So I think there are so many ways, not only people of color and not only Jews, but other people who are seen as different have to cope and, and belong and turn themselves into pretzels into this society, which purports right. to be a melting pot, purports mm -hmm. to be the land of immigrants, purports. Mm -hmm. But in fact, there is a template of white whiteness and Christianness. Oh, right. Absolutely. And um, mm -hmm. in the United States, I'm talking about, and that is a challenge for so many, so many groups in different ways. And we, you know, there's so many psychological things we could look at, eating pattern, eating disorder, you know, there's a whole host, a range mm -hmm. of adaptations that have been harmful and tragic. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I thank you so much. I think we probably have to say good night. So I want to close with um, a bunch of things, including thank yous. I want a, a very special thank you to Tanya Bentley at the Institute for the Study of Global Racial Justice who was just instrumental in all the logistics and all the publicity for this event. So thank you so much, Tanya. I look forward to working with you again in some other form. I also want to thank Karen Small, the managing director of the Bildner Center, who um, keeps the ship afloat and in turbulent times. And it's been very turbulent times this fall. And also we have the, um, the Bildner Center is a major symposium on Monday, Tuesday that Donovan and I have organized. So we have a lot we always have a lot on our plates, but all the more so. So I'm very grateful to Karen and the staff. I also want to say that both units, the Institute for the Study of uh, Global Racial Justice and the Bildner Center have a number of upcoming events. You can check out their websites. Maybe Tanya can put it in the chat, but I'll just tell you that tomorrow night, the Institute is hosting an in-person event at Alexander Library on the Rutgers New Brunswick campus at six, featuring the acclaimed poet, essayist and novelist Ocean Vong. And that should be, you know, an incredible event. And then two hours later, if you're not too tired, the Bildner Center is co-sponsoring with the Jewish Music Forum, a project um, on a legendary female cantor that is a prayer leader who did this in New Jersey for 15 years before women were allowed formally to become cantors. And that event is taking place at the Albers Schoenberg Room, um, which is on Sudam Street in New Brunswick. So um, again, that's um, you can find that on the Builder Center site or um, uh, 
And maybe Tanya, you can quickly put the Builder Center site into the chat. And then lastly, Professor Roman <laughs> happily is going to be speaking on Monday night, March 4th with Rachel Gordon and film critic Gene Seymour in a program called Not Quite White in Fiction and Film, Laura Z. Hobson's Gentleman's Agreement and Nella Larson's Passing. And that will be at 7.30 at Trey's Hall and Douglas College. Um, again, as part of our symposium on Black Americans and Jewish Americans. So it's been such a pleasure and great for me to be in conversation with you, uh, Donovan, but we've been talking a lot, but with you in particular, Michelle, Dr. Michelle Stevens, it's been too long that I haven't seen you in real time and I'm just happy to see you uh, virtually, so. Thank you all, this was phenomenal. Thank you. To the Thank you. To the participants. Thank you.